Look what I got. I got a new toy. Yes, I did. Happy birthday to me. Good morning, everybody. It's Stephen here for Bland Designs, and welcome to my weekly vlog for July the 13th, 2020. And it's day 124 of my isolation. Actually, I shouldn't call it my isolation. It's day 124 for my reckoning of since we've been in lockdown and various stages of lockdown for the COVID. And unfortunately, the end is not near. By the looks of things. Who knows? Maybe I'm wrong. I would like to be wrong, but we'll see. Okay, so let's get right into my current projects. You can see behind me, this is not done yet, but uh, remember this, I showed this to you I think a week ago, this pattern that I bought from a Canadian designer, uh, Brandy Maska. I can never say her name. She's Quilter on Fire anyways, and uh, she's from BC. And this is her design, and I mentioned that I could not get the fabrics that she calls for in this design, so I decided to put my own fabrics into it, and this is what I came up with. And I'm actually, I'm very happy with it. Now, you can only see about half of it. Um, there's more of it. Let me pull my microphone over. There's more of it down here, okay? But it's a giant maple leaf, our symbol for our country, Canada. And... Uh, what I did was I had to figure out how to get the fabrics in this area here and also I changed the, well I changed it all actually as far as color is concerned. So you see I want to do sort of a gradient purple down here and it ends up in a lighter purple down here and that splotch of red up there. And uh, this was a batik so I didn't have to worry about trying to do it in gradient, it already was and I thought because of the orangey yellow red tones to it. It's sort of uh, fall like colors, so I figured it would work. And I think it has, and I think it's worked very effectively. Now, I am going to add a couple of borders to this. Uh, in the pattern, it doesn't call for any borders, but I think it would look nice uh, with a mitered border around the outside. Mitered border is where you put things at a 45 degree angle. I have done them before, if you remember. You probably don't, but uh, um, I did a black and white and gray quilt some time ago. It was the quilt from hell, I called it. And that's the first quilt where I have ever done mitered borders. So I've done some video reviews uh, or looked at some videos to review for myself how to do mitered borders. They're not that difficult. And that's what I'm going to put on this one. And I'm thinking of using some of my Canada fabric, the o, Fa o Canada fabric line from Northcott, which is what this original pattern called for. I do have some of that. I might have enough to do a thin border around the outside of this, and then I'll use something else, probably the white that I used in the center of this, uh, as a wider border. And as I said, I'll do the miter, and then I'll layer it and quilt it. But I'm really happy with the way it turned out, um, and it wasn't that difficult. To, to make really. Um, there's a lot of sewing. There's a lot of little pieces in this, but really once you got going it went up, went together pretty fast. So that's one project. Um, another project I was working on is the July door uh, from Dimes, which is Designs and Machine Embroidery. They have a free door every month and I don't have it here to show it to you, so just give me one second. So here it is. Um, you've seen these before. Uh, they look a little different. Uh, they're all essentially the same base. Uh, they're based on a theme of a door. Uh, each one of the designs represents a month. This is July and they've got sort of a surfboard. Um, here in Ontario we do not surf, uh, but you know it's there and uh, it's kind of cute. Now this is all done in the hoop on the embroidery machine and yeah I was able to get through this one. So I now have seven of these. There are five more to go, five more months in this year. They can't go by fast enough, can they? And uh, then when they're all done, I'm going to put them together as a wall hanging. So yeah, I did that. Now, you're going to say, you embroidered that. Did you get your machine back? Is everything working fine? Uh, yes, no, and indifferent. Um, I will talk about that in a moment or two. Um, meanwhile, the other thing I've been working on, and this is kind of cool, 
there's I'm doing another quilt. But this quilt is all done in the hoop and it's principally an embroidery project and it's made up of various flower designs. But what's really cool about this design is the fact that you print out your own fabric. Yes, you can print fabric. And here's an example. And what they've done is they've given you about 12 different designs. And if you look at them really close, you can see they look like they've been embroidered. And in fact, the original design was embroidered and then they scanned it made into a high resolution graphic and you can print it out on fabric. And that's what you use around each block. And they do have a concept of a mock-up of what this quilt might look like when you're done. And here it is here. Now, of course, mine will look slightly different from this. Um, I don't know if I'll do these white sashings. Maybe I will. That's just a suggestion. And it's going to take some time because Right now I'm embroidering the first flower, which is this one, which is actually looks like a kind of a sunflower kind of thing, or I don't know what it is. Uh, but I've had to convert the colors because I'm not sure what colors they're using, what brand of thread. Um, but I converted it to Floriani um, because it came up on my embroidery machine as Janome, which is the default. And I have a little program on my iPhone. It's a little app that allows you to plug in the number for the Janome thread and give you the equivalent number in the Floriani thread. And I use principally Floriani threads. So I went ahead with that, but mine does not look anything like this in color. I mean, it looks okay, but it's not these colors. So I'm gonna have to do some investigation, see what thread they actually are using and then look at the conversion there. I mean, worst case scenario is I just picked the colors on my own. But it's easier if you can convert them or come close to the conversion because uh, well it's not easier it's just more time consuming so i'll have to check that out but anyways i'm making this first block as a test and we'll go from there um so we'll see this is going to take a long time now you might be wondering how you print on fabric and this is with an inkjet printer well there are various methods you can use um, one of the methods is to use what they call tap transfer artistic artist paper transfer artist paper which is a great product but basically it means you have to well you can use it and uh, what you have to do is you iron it to the fabric so in a sense it's an iron-on which is fine but that stuff's really expensive and it's not easy to get I had about two sheets of it left um, so I was at my local quilt store on the weekend again by appointment only face mask mandatory, two people in the store at a time, okay? Everything very being very, very safe. Um, and uh, I went looking for what they had, and they did have uh, some, I think they did actually have it, but for six sheets of it, it was something like $30, $31, and I need a minimum of 12 sheets. And I thought, mm, no, that's pretty pricey. But then I was talking to one of the other ladies in there, telling her what I was doing. And she says, well, there's this stuff. And she pulls out this package of these sheets called Johnny Sews Multipurpose Iron-On Stabilizing Paper. And uh, I'd forgotten about this. This is my package. I've had this package for probably a year and a half. I think I've used it once. But essentially what this is, and this is a lot cheaper, 50 sheets of this for $19 plus the sheets are reusable several times over. So um, what, what it is, is if you're familiar with the concept of using freezer paper, freezer paper has a glossy side and a side that has a, a, a thin film of plastic on it. And essentially what you're doing, it's the same with this, is these are eight and a half by 11 sheets. So they fit into your standard printer. Let me get one out and show you what it's like. And one side is kind of dull, and the other side is kind of glossy, and you can feel the difference when you have it in your hand. So you take your fabric, wrong side up, okay, so this is my fabric, so wrong side is that side, and you put this, the glossy piece, which is basically plastic, and you 
lay it down on your ironing board and you simply, it's kind of awkward to do it this way, but you get the point. You've got the wrong side down and you iron it and it melts that plastic and makes your fabric stick to this sheet. Then you take the sheet, you put it through your inkjet printer and presto bingo, it's printed. Now, you're going to wonder, is this, you know, safe to put into a washing machine? No. <laughs> um, I wouldn't recommend it. Now, I do heat set it afterwards. I go over it with a really hot iron and press it. And, uh, you know, that does make it fairly permanent. But I don't think I'd put it in the washing machine. Um, now, having said that, it depends on what kind of ink your ink prep, ink print jet ink jet printer get it out uh uses um mine the standard ink that, that i put in mine is not water soluble and i have done things in mixed media where i needed the ink i printed it out and then i used it as a layer in an art journal and to make it water uh resistant i've sprayed it with a light coating of workable fixative but i can't do that with this um so heat setting it does make it a little bit more stable, but I don't recommend you use this in a regular quilt, like a quilt that's going to be washed, because I don't think it's going to stand up at all. Um, but for something like this that I'm making, which is, is going to be more or less a um, wall hanging or more of a decorative type of quilt, I'm not worried about that. Um, but it's kind of cool to print your own fabric in using this manner. So could you use freezer paper? Yes, you can. Problem with freezer paper is, well, you might be able to get freezer paper in eight by and a half by 11 sheets. I don't know. I haven't really done any exploring of that. But the freezer paper I've got, and I got a ton of it, uh, which I bought a long time ago for some other project. Can you remember what that was for? Um, you'd have to cut it down. And it's a bit of a pain in the butt. I, I mean, it's doable. But you know, because it comes on a roll, so you gotta, you're fighting with it all the time to try to lay it flat so you can cut it. Whereas, sheets of this and for what these cost I mean $19 isn't bad for 50 sheets and as I said reusable up to a point eventually the plastic on the back just won't bother to melt there won't be enough of it but um, I've already printed two using one sheet of this and I'm going to see how many more I can get out of a sheet but anyways so if you're interested you want to print your own fabric for something something that's more of an art piece I would recommend that unless your printer has like ink uh, water resistant ink in it okay so those are the projects I've been up to just let me clean my desk out of my way and that takes us to um, the YouTube channel of the week love this guy he's Canadian he comes from um, Stratford Ontario Canada and well, here's the review. This week's YouTube channel is entitled Brittle Star. Kind of an unusual name, but this guy is a little bit unusual. If you enjoy my What's Pissing Me Off segment every week in my vlog, you're really going to love this YouTube channel. The star of this, which I'm not sure what his name is, comes from Stratford, Ontario, Canada. So not that far away from me. And I just discovered his YouTube channel. He makes social commentary on the issues of the day in both a humorous but serious light. He's obviously done his research uh, to put each of these segments together. So you will find them informative, but you'll also find them entertaining as well. So if you want something a little bit different, something that's about social commentary but with a twist, check out Brittle Star. So I've included the link to for that YouTube channel in the show notes below. Stephen and Walter Live is there as well. We talked yesterday a little bit about the whole thing with people who are refusing to wear masks. In our area, it has become mandatory. And I'm gonna say a little bit more about that in a few minutes. And uh, there is a, uh, a new episode of The Idiot Quilter, episode 72, where I show off my new toy, my new Steam Power um, Pro. I'm not sure if it's called Steam Power Pro, but it's a new iron. Anyways, I'm going to talk more about that in a few minutes when I review some of the new things that I have gotten my hands onto. Okay, and then of course there's the book of the week link is there. 
So that takes me to what's pissing me off this week. Okay, I mentioned a moment ago that we talked about the whole thing with masks on Stephen and Walter Live yesterday. And the question I put to everybody is, are there any real legitimate excuses for not wearing a mask during this time of the COVID? Now, what we are hearing is some people say they can't wear it for medical reasons, but nobody is being very specific about what those medical reasons are. Some people are saying they suffer from claustrophobia, and that's why they're not wearing a mask. Well, I understand the claustrophobia part because I am a claustrophobic. However, I have found that when you're wearing a mask, all you do is you just have to get a grip and talk yourself down. Yes, you can breathe. There's plenty of oxygen. Okay? So I don't really consider that a legitimate reason for not wearing a mask. Now, there are some people that have limited lung capacity for one reason or another. There are some people who are on oxygen. Okay, those ones I think I get, okay? And I think, yeah, those are legitimate excuses. But what people are doing, the ones that don't want to wear a mask are screaming that, well, first of all, they're saying, well, it's uncomfortable. We'll get over that. A lot of things about this whole crisis we're going through right now are uncomfortable comfortable so we have to survive but the one that really gets my goat is that it's my freedom my personal freedoms are being infringed upon because uh, I'm being told I have to wear a mask and that's not right well yesterday I did a whole number on you know how that stands in our country uh, you know and and freedoms in general and stuff like that so if you're interested in hearing that discussion then go to Stephen and Walter live links in the show notes. So I'm not going to get into that right now, but what I want to talk about is something that I just I saw the other day firsthand and I found it disturbing. So Walter and I on the weekend went to our local gro grocery store and of course in my area right now masks are mandatory. So there's usually somebody at any place you're going into standing out there, an employee, and making sure you're wearing a mask. If you're not wearing a mask, they either give you one or they don't let you into the store. And it is now the law in my area. Okay, so if you're not wearing a mask for whatever reason, you are breaking the law. Okay, fine. It's pretty clear cut. Most places have signs outside saying, stop. Do you have, you know, any symptoms of COVID? Are you wearing your mask? If you are not wearing your mask, you will not be allowed to enter these premises. You know, that kind of thing. So it's pretty clear pretty clear okay so we were getting a shopping buggy we had our masks on of course and we overheard a discussion actually it wasn't really a discussion it was one lady telling another lady why her husband was coming into the grocery store without wearing a mask they were an older couple but I wouldn't call them elderly okay I would say they were probably in my age bracket they're probably at 60 something now the lady that was doing all the talking with the store employee, she was wearing a mask, but her husband was not. Now, he did not look decrepit. Now, I have to be honest, I'm not sure what he looked like. Okay, this is probably bad to say, but you know those videos that they put up about the people of Walmart that are, you know, all over the YouTube? Well, this guy looked like he was a candidate for that, okay? Now, Maybe he did have a legitimate health reason, but she was doing all the talking for him. And when I say talking, she was doing all of the yelling about him. And this poor store employee was trying to be reasonable with this lady. She was explaining, these are not my rules. These are the rules of the store and of our local government. And I have to abide by them. And I'm an employee of the store. In fact, this lady, the employee actually said, she says, I have a breathing problem as well, but I have to wear the mask. But this lady wasn't taking taking any of this as a reason. Now, I don't know what her husband's problem was. He was remained quiet throughout this discussion. Um, but anyways, the employee did let the lady and her husband into the store. But I thought, well... 
Why was this lady jumping all over the head of this employee? She's just doing her job. I am sure she would rather be doing a lot of other things than playing um, fake cop, standing at the door and going, you got your mask on, you got your mask on, you got your mask on. I mean, what a pain in the butt, really. And it's not her rules. You know, it's not her fault. But this lady is jumping all over her. The thing is, I don't think this woman, from what I could hear of the discussion, I don't think she had a legitimate excuse for why her husband wasn't wearing a mask. Now, how do you know if people do have a legitimate excuse? That's the kicker. It's one person's word against another, isn't it? I mean, I think, I said this yesterday on Stephen and Walter Live, I think that people who have a legitimate medical reason for why they cannot wear a face mask should have to show one of these people who are standing at the door of a store a card that explains this, that says, you know, due to medical reasons um, certified by my doctor, I cannot wear a face mask. You know, something like that. They don't have to get into maybe the details of their medical history, but something like that, and something that looks official. You know, it's got the doctor's signature, a seal on it, it's laminated, I don't know. Of course, there's all kinds of problems with that kind of system, isn't there? One, you would have to go make an appointment with your doctor in one form or another to get a card like that. Two, will doctors charge? to give you a card like that. In our country, our doctors don't charge for much because most of our stuff is covered by our insurance plan. However, there are some things like doctor's notes. If people are away from their work sometimes for an extended period, they need to have a doctor's note and doctors, I think, charge for that now. Um, so would there be a charge involved? And what's to say someone couldn't fake the card, okay? So you're bringing in a whole lot of bureaucracy to get something like that. And a lot of people won't bother to do that. Other people would probably, probably scam the system and make their own fake cards. And it just gives lots of opportunity for scammers out there to jump on the bandwagon and make some money from this, right? Because there's scammers for everything, it seems, these days. So, yeah, would not be a perfect system. But nevertheless, I don't want to be that employee standing there and having the argument because, again, it's those people's word against your decision. And I can see an employee just getting so fed up and tired with this, go, yeah, sure, okay, no problem. Yeah, I can't wear a mask because um, it clashes with my eyes. Oh, yeah, sure, come on in. That's a good excuse. Yeah, I can't wear a mask because um, I don't have one to match my purse. Yeah, okay, go in right so it kind of defeats the whole purpose of everything right now you would hope that those people going into an environment like that and really do not have a legitimate reason for not wearing a mask would be shamed just by the physical presence of everybody else around them wearing a mask but then again those type of people probably don't care so back to my main point of this what pisses me off is jumping down the throat of this employee in a grocery store Okay, employees in essential services like grocery stores, that kind of thing, have already had a bad time. Here they are, they're having to work because these things are essential services. They have to work. They're putting their own lives literally on the line uh, for this kind of situation. Let's cut them a break, shall we? Why don't we just do what the law says? Really, um, it's getting to the point now where wearing a mask, for me anyways, is becoming second nature. They hang. We have a whole bunch of them. Walter was going crazy on his embroidery machine making a lot of them in this past week. We have a whole bunch of them uh, sitting on our hall tree by our front door. As we go out, we grab a mask. And as we get out of the car to wherever we're going, we put it on. Yeah, I admit that it's not the most comfortable thing in the world. Um, what's kind of <laughs> dumb. Here's my reason. I don't want to wear a mask because when I put on a mask and I have on my glasses, I fog up my glasses. Go on in. Sure, no problem. No, th this is true. It does fog up my glasses. I guess when I breathe, it goes up and it fogs my glasses. Um, yeah, well, that's a minor inconvenience in comparison to, you know, the consequences of not wearing a mask as far as I'm concerned. So really, let's give these people a break. 
it's not their rules, but unfortunately they've been given the responsibility to, um, you know, check people to make sure they've got their masks on and are obeying the law. In our country, I don't think this is going to be a major problem. We have a few jerks out there who um, won't wear their mask because they think it's an impingement or an infringement on their personal liberties. It is not. Not in this country. And again, I reference back to what we talked about yesterday in Stephen and Walter Lie. In the United States, Americans have a very inflated, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? A very inflated uh, sense of, of their personal liberties. You know, everything's an infringement on their personal liberties. Okay, and we can see the results from that, can't we? Yes, we just look south of the border and what's the latest? Like over 15,000 cases in one day in Florida. And of course they opened up Disney this weekend. Brilliant, just brilliant. Ah, I'll say no more. Um, I really feel sorry for the Americans who are trying to play by the rules, who are trying to keep other people safe and themselves safe. I feel sorry for them that they live in such a country like that where it's full of a whole lot of yahoos. There, I've said it. But it's true. It makes me proud to be a Canadian. It makes me feel safer, too. I mean, we have our yahoos as well. Just, I don't think as many. But anyways, I digress. Okay. I'm sure somebody's going to write comments to me and consider the you know, that I've insulted all of America. I don't care. <laughs> I don't. Um, okay. So, yeah, that's what's pissing me off. So be kind to the people that are just doing their job. It's bad enough and it's rough enough right now in this time that we're going through. So give them a break, for God's sakes. Wear a damn mask. Okay. Let's move on to the uh, product reviews. So, I did buy a few things online this week. You know, Christmas is just around the corner. <laughs> well, it's not, but it is. And if you're a quilter and you're making things for Christmas, you got to get started now. And actually, the Christmas lines of fabric come out about now. Um, I was in my quilt store the other day, and they really didn't have much yet, but they're getting it in. But I went online, and I went to a spot that I've been to before called thequiltstore.ca, and boy, were they fast. Um, I got all this fabric, fabric I'm about to show you in about 24 hours, like in a day. The next day after I ordered it, I got it. That, I mean, that's incredibly fast. But anyways, that's Amazon fast. In fact, even faster than Amazon these days. So here's my butt. I'm not going to take them all out. I got them in this basket all folded up. There's two meters of each of these. Um... I am a little disappointed in this selection. I am not disappointed with the company I bought it from. I'm disappointed in what the fabric actually looked like when I got it. I mean, this one's okay, this one's okay, this one's okay. Um, that one's all right. This one, this is actually a Tim Holtz one. Um, show you. But when I saw it online, it looked, it's the same pattern online. It's just the colors are a little bit deeper, I thought, uh, when I saw it online. And, uh, but I mean, it'll work. You, you cut them into little pieces. So, you know, I'm not that disappointed. And again, it has nothing to do with the company. It has everything to do with, um, you know, color shifting. Uh, what you see on a, uh, on a monitor and what you see in real life can be very different. For example, this one. If I had seen this fabric actually in the quilt store, I would have walked right by it because I wouldn't have touched it. But when I saw it online, the blues were a little different shade. Um, again, because of that color shift in the technology. And so I really, it's, it's sort of a gradient, but uh, it looks quite frankly a little cheap to me. The fabric isn't cheap. I mean, it's good quality cotton, what you would expect. It's just not what I was expecting. But I have it, and it won't go amiss. I will find something to do with it. It's just not what I was looking for. But I do have fabric left over from last year, but it's in smaller pieces, so I do need to get more fabric. And uh, I'm looking at patterns for Christmas quilts and things like that. I think I made a Christmas quilt last year. I gotta look at it. I forget what quilts I've made. Hmm. 
that's not good. Um, and uh, I've got a couple of patterns that I've pulled out. I actually went through all my pattern collection and I have a lot of patterns that I've collected, which I'll never get done in this lifetime. Um, but I collect patterns and uh, I looked online for some more. I'm always looking for freebies in that line. And there's actually quite a few to be found. And I put them all in a binder. I printed them out, put them in a binder, and I'll probably design something that's a combination of several of these patterns or whatever. But first I gotta get the fabric for them. So I'm waiting for when my local quilt store gets their supply in, and then I will go down and I will buy um, fabric. Okay, so that, um, what else? Okay, so I got a new toy, okay? Now, I think I've mentioned this before about irons. And actually, the idiot quilter that's referenced in the show notes this week is all about irons. Um, and I have quite a few, okay? Again, you probably will wonder, why do you have more than one iron? Well, it's because I do. <laughs> what can I say? But the iron that I have wanted for a while is one by Rowenta. And it is a steam, I think they call it the Steam Pro or something like that. I forget exactly what the name of it is. But essentially what this is, is the iron sits on top of a big tank. The tank has the water. So instead of having to fill your iron, you know, often, um, my other iron that I was using, it would take about um, a cup of water. And you'd go through that in like pff, no time in steaming. Plus it didn't steam very well. This sucker in the tank takes 1.4 liters of water heats it up really fast, and the steam is incredible from this iron. So I've taken an excerpt from the Idiot Quilter episode that I've already referenced to show you what this iron is all about. Now this is a little longer excerpt. I think it runs about eight minutes. And if you're not interested in irons at all, just fast forward beyond it. But it is an incredible iron. This way. And there it is. This is the Ro Rowenta um, Perfect Steam Iron. It's industrial strength. Uh, this little bad boy holds 1.4 liters of water. This is the tank on the front of it. The iron sits on top of the unit. You plug the unit in. It's all corded here. Oops, I'm sorry. You can't see what I'm talking about. There we go. It is a monster. Yes. Is this meant to be transported? No. However, if you have to transport it, it has this little clip at the front. You can now pick the whole thing up using the uh, iron handle itself. I don't recommend doing that too often because this is really, really heavy. But if you have to, like from a table to another table, you can do that. Now it's heating up. Let me show you what's on the back here. Okay, so you have a series of buttons and actually it works very easily. You have an on-off button and uh, right now my plug is in the way. Okay, give me just a second here. Okay, so the on-off button is down here. Does this have an automatic shut off? No, it doesn't. And that is something I wish it did have. Okay, but I can live without that right now. On the back, it indicates here, you see this flashing green light going on and off. That's for the steam. When that goes solid, you know your iron is ready to go. And you can hear it boiling the water inside. We're bringing it up to temperature. On the side of the iron itself, there's a red indicator light. And when that goes solid, and this goes solid, you know your iron is ready to go in terms of steam. Now it does have a pretty heavy cord here because this is both the water and the electricity running to it. And it isn't humongous, humongous very long. Find the right words here. Find your words. Um, but for what I'm using it for, I think that's fine. It does have a fairly long cord with it for plugging it in. You only have to plug in one plug 
for this. It's not two. There isn't a separate one for the iron and one for the reservoir. No. Um, other buttons on here. When it's running out of water, this light will go on here so you know when to fill it up. And it's really easy to fill it up. And I can't take the tank off right now because it's heated up and it says not to do that. But this front part, let me move this around. Oops. <laughs> yeah, that's me. It's, okay. You heard it. That was that steam. Um, this tank, this is the tank. There's a little handle here. You lift it straight off. You take it over to your faucet. You fill it up. There's a spot that's marked on the inside that shows you how far to fill it so you don't overfill it. And then it just drops right back down in. It's really easy to, to use. You'll notice I'm putting this little clip on here. This surface that the iron sits on is silicone. It's meant for the high temperature of this iron. So there you go. So this iron does not pop, but that's where you place it. Um, also on the back, there is an Econo mode and a reset. The Econo mode is used, uh, it just saves on power, but it keeps everything, I'm not sure how that works, but it keeps everything working fine. So you don't have to wait for it to heat up. You can put it on Econo mode and I have it on Econo mode right now. There's a restart button and that's what you hit when you refill the tank of water that turns off the light that says that you need it water. And on the side here, there's a little knob. And I'm not going to open this up, but it has a calcium cleaner. And it's some little bracket in there that after six months or 25 hours of use or something like that, you just unscrew that. You make sure the iron is, it says, is completely cool. It says, let the iron, have the iron turned off for two hours before you open this, because this is under pressure and you could really hurt yourself uh, with this. You unscrew it, you take it out, you rinse under a tap, you put it back in, bang, away you go. Okay, so I think that's kind of a nice feature as well because, you know, depending on your area and where the water, what your source of water is, um, that you may have a calcium buildup problem. So that's basically how it works. It has your standard dial on the top here for setting for whatever fabric you're, you're doing. And there's a trigger under here for blasting things with steam, okay, which is really nice. So I'm going to show you how much steam you get out of this. So let's just unlock that. Um, you don't have to lock and unlock that all the time. That's just uh, if, you know, when you're not using it or when you want to transport it. Um, so here we go. So yesterday I used it for the first time on some seams and I don't know. Whoa, okay, a lot of steam there. I have this problem, and I will get used to this. I have a tendency to hit the trigger when I'm moving this around. That's... I think you can see how much steam you're getting out of this. So let's just take this piece of fabric and let's fold it over a couple of times. And let's see if we can flatten that sucker. Okay, first of all, no steam. Yeah, that works okay. But, oh, I guess you can't see that, can you? Okay, let me see if I can. Okay, now I'm going to lose that. There we go. Sorry if you're a little crooked. Okay, no steam. Flatten it right out. So you take a look at that. That's how much steam. I'm probably steaming up the camera. Uh, how much steam you can get out of this. So really, really good. And that's what you want in an iron. Um, now this little piece of fabric, I've got some folds in it now. Let's try it again. Let's just see. Ironing it dry, pretty much flattened it out, but let's give it some steam. Yes. Just like that. So, this iron, let me bring this back up a little bit. So, to me, this is my ideal iron. Now, I haven't had it long. I just got it yesterday, as I said. How much is this iron? Well, it depends on where you go. This came from Amazon, amazon.ca. 
I think it was about 360 bucks. Uh, I was on Prime, so it was free shipping. And yeah, uh, that's a lot of money for an iron. But I think it's well worth it. In my experience now with irons over the last hmm, two and a half years of doing this hobby. So I'm really pleased with it so far. Um, it does come with a one year warranty as well. And um, which I said is standard with most. The only thing that I think I would have liked to see is an automatic shutoff on this, but it does not have that. Um, not a big deal. You just have to remember to shut it off and flick of the switch, it's off. Now, it's still very, very hot, of course, but you want to set this up in an area where, you know, you're, you don't have to get it out all the time and use it. Now, if you're somebody that doesn't have a dedicated sewing room or dedicated sewing area where you can set up these things, and let's go here. So I guess you can see that I've got the granddaddy of the iron systems and I'm loving it. I'm absolutely loving it. And Walter bought it for me for my birthday. And I'll say more about that in a few minutes. So that takes us to book of the week. And keeping with the theme that we've had lately about making your own books, uh, and I mean books, not so much journals. I mean, journals and books are somewhat the same thing, but I think in the crafting world, when we refer to journals and albums, we're thinking of the more handmade, fold paper, stick stuff in. And when we say books, we think more like hard bound books, hard cover books. And so there is, there's a whole art and science to making one of those kind of books, as I've mentioned before. And here's another one of those books that tells you how to do it. Making Handmade Books, 100 Plus Bindings, Structures, and Forms. This is a great um, reference book. It's very, very detailed. Very, very detailed. But if you have to buy one book, all you want is one book to get yourself into this, but get yourself into this on a more professional level, then I would recommend this book because it is very good because it doesn't only just show you the basics but it shows you all kinds of different types of binding techniques and also different forms your book can take um, and you know again you're moving in from basic book binding into creating art books books that in and themselves are works of art so this is excellent for that this was also very reasonably priced at the time that I bought it uh, on here, it was listed as $23.95 Canadian. So, once again, I went to Amazon to find out how much they're selling it for. And you can get it on Amazon for roughly about the same price. $22.72 Canadian, about a buck less. And it was on Prime. So, of course, free shipping if you have Prime. So, that's a pretty good price for a book. This is a big book. That's a pretty good price for this. So, if you're interested... Um, you can go to Amazon. Well, I've got the link in the show notes for that. And again, it's called Making Handmade Books, 100 Plus Binding Structures and Forms by Alyssa Golden. And so it's a really, it's worth the investment. At that price, it's worth the investment. Okay, so that takes us to Works in Progress. Last week, we finished up the Grimoire. Um, this week, we're starting a brand new project. Now, this project is based upon some of Mike Deacon's Digi Downloads. Um, actually, the ones that I'm using for this, it's called the Clockwork Garden, are actually Ian's, his partner's uh, Digi Downloads. And so I'm making a more, uh, more of a book than journal with this, because is, it is going to have hard covers for it. So. In this little segment, I'm showing you my basic prep and share some of my ideas as to what direction I will be going in. So for my next project, I thought I would do something I'm going to call the Clockwork Garden Journal. Now I'm calling it that because Mike Deacon and his partner Ian have come up with a new Digi Download set, and I love his Digi Download sets, and they call it Clockwork Garden. I bought the set 
and now I'm going to take it and use it to make my journal. Now I'm sort of modeling it after journals that uh, Ian has been making, um, but I'm going to of course put my own spin on it. So what I have here are all the printed out all the pages that are in the set and actually there's quite a few pages and you can see they have these little note cards here and then they have tags and then they have um, pockets and another type of pocket right here there's quite a few pages in this set and then these are the actual pages for the signatures in the journal as well, so I printed these all out on cardstock to take a look at what they might look like. And I've gone ahead and started to design my signatures. And by the way, these are very reasonably priced and it's a download so you don't have to work, wait for them to be mailed to you. They're in PDF format and I think it was £7.50. It works out in Canadian dollars to about $17. But I think there's 20 pages uh, of elements so that's really not a bad price at all and they are high quality uh, resolution um, high resolution so I have already made my signatures for this journal and I have them here now I printed these on a heavier paper this is not copy paper this is actually paper I believe I bought a long time ago in a stationery store for resumes so it's a little off-white as you can see and what I did was I took each of the pages that they have designed, that Ian and Mike have designed, and I've made them into my signatures. Now each signature has about five pages, double pages in it, so ten pages. And um, they're all the same. At first I thought I'd make the signatures uh, different according to each set, like one called Collecting Memories, and there was another one in here called Ideas, and then another one called Trust Your Heart, that kind of thing, but I decided against that. And I just mixed them all up, and I made five signatures. So there's quite a few signatures here. Now what I also did was I sewed the signatures down the middle of the fold. Uh, with my sewing machine. I made it a little wider stitch and just went right down the center. So now they're all bound together. Now my idea is that these will be placed in the um, journal uh, using the, a system whereby you're, usually, you're basically using elastic uh, and you can slip these underneath the elastic and so when one set gets filled up you can take it out and you can replace it with another set uh, as well. So that's how I'm going to do it. Now, over here you can see I've started my cover. This will be a hardcover journal. I haven't made a hardcover journal in quite a while. So I have chipboard here, fairly good chipboard. I think this might be Cricut's chipboard. And I've cut a front and a back cover. And I've made them slightly bigger, as you'll see, than the signatures. So that they're about a quarter inch more on the side. So these won't be peeking out. You'll only see the cover and the same at the top and the bottom as well. I've cut out my spine. Now at first I wasn't sure how big the spine should be. I had a three quarter inch spine. I had a one inch spine, a one and a half inch spine, and I have settled on a two inch spine. And that should be good for all of these signatures, as you can see. It'll line up with a little bit of wiggle room as well. Now I don't intend to have 3D embellishments in this because this is more of a, a formal type of journal. Um, so the beauty of this journal or the decoration of this journal comes with the design that Mike and Ian have designed on each of their pages as well. And I will add some of the tag elements, some of the pocket elements afterwards as well. So this will be my hardcover with the spine. And I think I'm going to cover this using a white book cloth. I have some of that. That'll give it just a, a little bit more luxurious look to it. Now, I am debating as to whether I am going to put the elastics in first. Um, actually, I'll need to cover uh, the inside with some fancy paper as well, and I haven't decided what, <coughs> excuse me, what that's going to be yet. Um, 
and whether or not on the outside of the spine I want the elastic to be seen or not to be seen. Now if I put the elastic underneath the book cloth there will be um, bumps. So I have to look and see what color of elastic I have. I think I have some gold elastic that might look very nice with it. And just experiment first before I cover any of these pages to see what it would look like on the outside. So that's where I'm at right now. As I, as with all my projects, this is an evolutionary kind of thing because I don't know what I'm doing from one step to the next. I just let it organically grow uh, as I create it and it will take on a life of its own. At least that's my theory. So stay tuned for the next segment. So next week we will build on that and we'll see where it goes from there. And you know me, uh, these things usually take a, a life of their own on, uh, so it will evolve. So what's been happening the past week? Well, update on my mother, she's fine. It's been four months since I've seen her, but I talked to her. Now, I'm cutting down the number of times I call her in a week because she's just not answering her phone as I explained last week. So now I'm putting it down to about once a week. So about the middle of the week, I think I'll give her a call. If she answers the phone, she answers the phone. If she doesn't answer the phone, I'll try again until I do get her. But I'm not gonna try this repeated thing day after day because to be honest, one, she doesn't seem to care <laughs> whether I call her or not. Um, she doesn't seem to really care. She hasn't once said that, you know, she wishes she could see us. She doesn't say that. So from that, I have to assume that she is fine with the way the situation is right now. I know she's being looked after, so that's great. So we just move on. Um, update on my sewing machine. <laughs> okay, so you know that I took in the embroidery unit uh, for the stores machine which i have right now so they could try that on my machine this gets complicated to to eliminate or to at least see whether or not the problem stems from the embroidery unit itself well guess what it doesn't nope i just got back a few days ago the, my original embroidery unit i'm still using the stores machine but I now have my embroidery unit back. And this weekend, I did all kinds of embroidery projects using that. Didn't have a problem once with any one of the projects. Worked like a charm. Now remember, I'm using the stores machine, but my embroidery unit. So where's my machine? My machine has gone to headquarters, Janome headquarters in Oakville. Oakville's on the west side of Toronto. So basically it got to the point where Shirley and her technician Roy, it's beyond them. So I don't know how long it'll be at Janome. We'll see. I just hope it gets fixed. In the meantime, I'm using the stores machine with no problems, knock wood. So what does this tell me? One, it isn't my problem. I didn't do anything, okay? that caused this problem. It is something in the machine. Now, okay, yeah, maybe I did do something, you know, in the sense that I'm using it, but I don't abuse it. So I don't know. Now, way back when, when this problem first started and I had the, my machine in at the shop, Shirley did say to me, it could be one of the computer components because these machines are all computerized, right? And she said, um, she had a problem with the machine a few years ago and it was a computer component and all they do is snap out the one the bad component snap in a new one presto bingo everything works okay great and it could be that okay could be a faulty computer component for some reason i don't know we'll see the one thing that kind of bothered me when i was in and i was talking to shirley about it the other day is that she says and you know um the, some of these components and things in your machine are still under warranty. Well, that's good to know because my machine only has a one-year warranty. You would think a $14,000 machine would have at least a five-year warranty, right? No, nothing has a five-year warranty anymore. 
appliances, electronic equipment, everybody's got the standard one year warranty kind of thing on them. So we'll see. Because now I'm getting a little worried about, hmm, how much is this going to cost me? Especially if it's not my fault. I don't know. But we'll wait and see uh, for all of this. So I don't know how long this is going to take. I'm not going to bug Shirley about it. I know that she's already frustrated as hell uh, with my machine, and I don't blame her. I would be too. So I'm not going to be one of those kind of people. I know it's being looked after. I, in the meantime, I've got a machine that I can use. So I'm not going to be one of those people that, when's my machine going to be back? When's my machine going to be back? When's my machine going to be back? You know, because those kind of people you just want to like blow away. Kind of a thing. So that's with that. And now, I think you've noticed something different. I got a haircut. Yay! I'm keeping the beard for now. But I got a haircut. And in fact, when I went in and got my haircut, uh, she actually trimmed my beard. So it was nice to have it professionally trimmed and that kind of thing. And I have appointments for the, up until October already booked. I usually get my hair cut every three weeks. So I'm back on that schedule. Yes, it was a little unusual. Uh, we're wearing our masks. Uh, there's limited number of staff and customers in the shop. You have to answer a questionnaire when you go in and they disinfect everything and whatnot. Yes, it's very strange, but I got my hair cut. Walter got his cut too. So we look like brand new people. And I'm so glad. So, in fact, I have a little short, fun little 30 second video here showing my, what I call, hair evolution. Now, I don't take good pictures of myself, <laughs> okay? But I just want to show you, I hope you got the sense of, like, where I've been and where I am now. Okay, and what else happened this week? Well, let's talk about cooking. Walter was experimenting again, so he made lemon chicken one night, which actually I had made lemon chicken, chicken from a recipe that I found on the internet at one point in time, which turned out I didn't think too bad. He did a similar one. Um, it wasn't as, well, I, okay, I'm trying not to say it wasn't as good as mine, uh, because Walter's a better cook than me anyways, and so I would like to say that and go, nah, 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 but, uh, it was okay. Actually, what was really good about it was the actual lemon sauce that went on it. I really liked that. The other was edible and everything. It just, it was sort of like, nah, you know, I don't think I'd use that recipe again, kind of a thing. But then he decided to make on, uh, what was it, Saturday or Friday? I mean, it was Friday night, something. He made cheese balls. Now, you know those cheese sticks you can get in the frozen food section of the grocery store as an appetizer? You know, the, the like, uh, some are stuffed in jalapenos or, uh, you know, basically they're deep fried chunks of cheese. Okay, like real healthy, not, but delicious, yes. Um, so he found a recipe and decided to make them himself. They were much lighter than the ones you buy in the grocery store. He did deep fry them. Um, so yeah, you got the one thing. We, we don't eat a lot of deep fried food. So, you know, this was a rarity. But I mean, we're not eating this kind of stuff every day. So okay, once every blue moon, it's not going to kill you. Or maybe it will. Um, but they were really good. So I thought I'd show you what Walter's balls look like. Cheese balls, I'm talking about. So what's Walter cooking this week? Walter made homemade cheese balls. And apparently they're very easy mm -hmm. and delicious. They're very light. So what's in your cheese balls? Flour and cheese and pepper and cayenne pepper and that's about it. And you said you made first a type of roux with flour and water. Mm -hmm. And then you mix that in with your cheese and then mm -hmm. you get your spices. And then you, what? Uh, Refrigerate it. Oh. How and then you, you just um, 
It's supposed to be for an hour. I heard Dre and I, I, my cheese was cold, so I. And then you um, just roll them in balls and throw them in the deep fryer. So it is a deep fried thing, though. So these are Walter's cheesy cheese balls. So I think that one, that recipe is a keeper. And according to Walter, it was pretty easy to make. Um, and if you're interested, I think he got that recipe from a YouTube video that's called uh, Cooking with John. I think that's what it's called. Um, and that guy, Walter's done several of his recipes. Uh, and they're actually pretty good. He, he's it, His videos, are, I guess, are pretty clear. The instructions are pretty clear. And the ingredients are not like way out there they're usually stuff you've got laying around so you know um, just do a search for cooking with John I think that's what it's called um, and you'll find that recipe that Walter did with the cheese balls and a whole bunch of other ones there that you might be interested in okay so what's coming up my birthday it's my birthday it's my birthday whoa big deal um, at my age do you really care about your birthday yeah actually I do okay my birthday was always something I look forward to when I was a kid. Um, and my birthday's tomorrow, July the 14th. And yes, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I know you're all saying happy birthday. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, a little strange this year because, one, what we've done the last couple of years is on the weekend before or right after my birthday, we go to a place uh, that's about an hour and a half two hours away from us, an area of Ontario. It's on the other side of Toronto. And uh, it's basically Mennonite country. And there's all kinds of quilt shops within like a mm, 50 kilometer radius kind of a thing. And we make the circuit, as I call it. And I go nuts. I put aside money for this event every year. So I, and I will drop $1,500 on fabric, okay? And um, we go for the weekend. Usually we have tickets to go to uh, a play in Stratford, Ontario. Uh, that's where the Shakespearean Festival is every year as well. And we go and we see something. We don't necessarily go to see Shakespeare. I mean, last year we went and saw... What did we see last year? Okay, good memory. I can't remember what we saw last year. This year we had tickets to see Spamalot. You know, Monty Python, Spamalot. But of course with COVID, not going to happen. That's all shut down. We did get our money back, no problem, from that uh, place. Um, so, you know, uh, that was good. But that's what we do. And of course we go out, we're there for, we usually go for three days, kind of a thing. And it's a nice area to travel around in. It's very country-ish and lots of neat little stores and shops plus the quilting places. Well, not doing that this year. So, and usually Walter, you know, takes me out for dinner, kind of a deal. Last year we went to the keg in um, Kitchener-Waterloo. That's the area, um, which was very nice. Uh, so, Walter said to me, so, where do you want to go for dinner for your birthday this year? And I said, oh, maybe the dining room? <laughs> Yeah, we're not going anywhere, obviously. Um, we will have a special dinner. Um, I've already told him what I want. Um, basically, Chateaubriand uh, kind of thing. What's Chateaubriand, you may say? It's basically Philly Mignon and fancy vegetables with artichoke hearts in those, with amongst those vegetables. Um, actually, it's something that is extremely overpriced in a restaurant. It's just a good piece of meat, okay, with vegetables, more than anything. But that's what I want. And we have some good pieces of meat, and Walter will do them with the sous vide, so they'll come out perfect. And uh, I bought a can of artichokes, and we'll have, maybe get some other vegetables or whatever, and we will do Chateaubriand with a nice bottle of Beaujolais. And we do have a nice bottle of Beaujolais sitting in, upstairs in the wine fridge. Um, and that'll be my birthday. Um, I wonder if I can talk him into making me a cake or something <laughs> as well. I mean, Walter makes really good pastry. So, a birthday pie. You know, I'd rather have pie than cake. Okay? But he's got some recipes he hasn't done in a long time uh, for, you know, 
I'll have to talk to him, see what he's got in mind uh, with this. But anyways, that'll be my birthday. Um, and as I said, you know, birthdays you get to this age. How old am I, are you going to ask? Well, I'm holding on 29 now for about the, oh, let's see. Well, I'm 63. I'll be 63. I'm 62 today. Okay, I'm still 62. 63. How did that happen? Really? I, I feel like I'm 23. I, I really do. I say this to people all the time. I feel like I'm 23 years old. And I guess that's because I have my health. I'm mobile. I can get around. Um, yeah, I've slowed down a little bit over the years since, you know, I'm not moving at the speed I used to move at at 23. But I'm good. So, you know, thank whoever for that one. Um, so, you know... I suppose you should look at it as a milestone. You know, there was a day and an age, if someone was 63 years old, they were probably dead <laughs> in times gone by. So here we go. And you know, every day is a new adventure as far as I'm concerned. So, you know, keep that up in my mind. And you know, the next 63 years will probably be a little harder, but <laughs> we'll get through those. Okay, yeah. Um, so, what else is coming up? Well, one thing I just forgot to mention to you that already happened is, you know the river cruise thing? We got 50% of our money back, finally. Yes, we got almost $10,000 back from the cruise company itself. It took a long time, but we got that part of it. Now, mind you, they were pretty much obligated to give that to us because that's Part of the contract we cancelled the cruise and you know all the if ands and buts around all of that and so that was in the contract that if we cancelled the cruise by a certain date we would get 50 percent of our money back so they came through with it we got it makes us very happy now we're fighting with the insurance company for the other 50 percent and i already explained all that to you a few weeks ago we haven't heard anything more from them yet, but these things take time, so we're just going to be patient and wait a little bit longer, and then maybe we will contact them again. We're not going to let that just die. No, because that's another $10,000. All right? So, no. No, we're not made of money. So, yeah. But anyways, that was really a nice surprise this week that we got it, because really, we weren't expecting to get anything back from them until the earliest, not until into August. So, yeah, that was a good thing. Okay, so what are we doing today? Oh, excitement. Yay, we're going out. Where are we going? To Ikea. Yes, we're going to Ikea. Are we going into Ikea? No, we're doing curbside pickup. Walter bought a, himself a new toy last weekend. He bought a cover stitch machine. Um, essentially, a cover stitch machine is a machine that does nothing but hem. And since he's into garment making these days... He thought it was worth the investment. So he got one. He got it for a good price at our quilt store. And so now he's got an embroidery machine, a sewing machine, a serger, and a cover stitch machine. Things are piling up. He needs more space. So he has figured out a way to reorganize and declutter uh, his office. Okay, his office is basically one of our bedrooms in the house, and it's not a huge bedroom. And uh, he needs another table. So he's ordered online uh, a table uh, from Ikea and we were to go there today and between 12 and 2 uh, do curbside pickup for this. So we'll see how this works with them because uh, Ikea we have not been in too impressed with on how they've been handling things during this COVID. At least the Ikea is in our province. Um, for example... Walter could have had it delivered for 60 bucks, And really, because this these thing is heavy, you know how everything comes in a little box and you got some assembly required with them. Well, those little boxes are heavy and whatnot. And so for 60 bucks, he figured that'd be okay. Well, yeah, he could get it delivered. It wouldn't come until September the 1st. Really? You're that busy? Okay. So, nope, that wasn't an option. Um... We could go actually into the store itself, but 
Ikeas are always busy. It doesn't matter what day of the week you go to, they're always busy. And I just don't want to take a chance. And these, in this Ikea, the two Ikeas that we have closest to us are located in Toronto. And Toronto is the epicenter for the disease right now. We just don't want to take the chance. So when he first looked at curbside, they said they had nothing available for weeks on end. Then he went on again the next day to check it. Bang, yeah, we could pick it up on uh, Monday, today between 12 and 2. So he made the arrangements. So we'll see how well this goes. It was really going to piss us off if we get there and they have screwed this up in one form or another. So this will be the test for that. Okay, so that's what's coming up. All right, so just before I say goodbye to you for this week, I just want to say one other thing. Things are opening up here in our country and in our province. I'm not even going to talk about the states because that's just a shitstorm going on in there right now. And I really feel sorry for, you know, the average American, the average American that has some common sense. OK, and I hope that we as Canadians with things opening up a little with restrictions right now, don't become complacent about the whole thing, meaning wear your mask, take all the precautions. They're warning us that there's going to be a second wave. And they figure the second wave, they don't want the second wave to be worse than what the first wave has been. But they're saying if we, if we let down our guard, if we don't handle things the way we should be handling them, if we get a false sense of security and safety, then the second wave is going to be even worse. And so everything we've done up to this point in time will be moot. So let's not become complacent about what is happening. Let's keep the rules now so that eventually we can come out on the good side of all of this. So having said that, wear your mask, keep your social distancing, don't be partying with thousands of people you don't know. Stay healthy, stay well, stay in, and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye.